Well, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. On Sunday, we talked about the uh, the transition from shepherds to kings, uh, and the angels, and the, and the voice of God declared uh, for the shepherds to find him in a manger. And uh, but in Matthew, we see the picture that Jesus was no longer in a manger; he was no longer a babe, but he was a child in the house. And the wise men went to seek a king to do what? Worship him. And this has really been the intent of God all along for humanity. It was for no other reason that man would be created in his image and likeness, that the pureness of their lives would be one like his, which really is... Um, the reality of what worship is. Worship is living the life of Christ. The only way He is. And if you remember that um, Herod had talked to them, the, the wise men, about when you find Him, come and tell me. His Motives were not pure. His motives were to um, make sure that the wise men heard the right words and would bring uh, bring him words so that he could eliminate uh, Jesus. But uh, he couldn't do it because the seed is incorruptible. It's impossible to kill the seed. And um, no matter what the enemy tries to do, it cannot kill the seed. And so God gave them direction to go another way. And once we've come to this understanding that the only reason you live is to walk another way. It's to live another life. It's not your life. It's not my life. It's His life. And the whole thing that He desired is for you and I to express His nature, His character, His authority, His honor, and His glory. It's the only reason to live. (laughs) This is why we worship Him. This is why we live and walk uprightly. This is what God has determined for His people, His children... You know, the truth of the matter is, the litmus test is this. How do you know you're a Christian? Because somebody told you? Or the way you live? Not even just the way you think. Herod said, hey, I want to worship him. But his motives and his actions were totally opposite. Because Herod was a wicked king. And the angel of the Lord had to come and take care of business, you know, to move him off the scene. But he wasn't a nice man. He wasn't like Paul in the context of beast to beauty, was he? And no matter what anybody says, you have to get it right while you're living. There's no second chances after you die. The spirit returns back to the God who made or gave. but the body returns to the dust. So the reason to live is to worship Him. And I don't want to get into the deep end of the pool about that, but God never intended mankind to die. He created them in His image, after His likeness, to have dominion, to rule, not like humans do, like God does. Man rules from above. God rules from underneath by lifting up. He is a giver, a supplier, a joint of supply. Where everything becomes fitly framed together as one unit. Unity. Communion and fellowship. Where no one has the, I think, the opinion or what they're Emotions and feelings are. They don't count. Not in God's economy. 
How do you know? That's what happened when you went to the waters of baptism. He cut you off. The old man is dead. So the new man can't live that way anymore. It has to be another way or another walk, another life. And because it was totally impossible for man to do this, God gave us his spirit. After the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension. I, I, I know it's a cliche, but Thanksgiving really is every day. It literally is. If you're not thankful that he gave his life so you could live and worship him, the reason you live is to become conformed to the image of of the Son, which is more than one person. The Spirit of the Son. You know, I, I find myself more and more just, you know, you just read the Scriptures and it's like every time you see the Son, like it's looking into the mirror, isn't it? It's the man in the mirror. It literally is your life in Him. There's nothing else. Why would you want anything else? All that does is bring death. When he came to give life, and life much more abundantly. That doesn't mean a good man's life or a good human life plus God. It's totally outside the whole scope of what man hasn't seen, he hasn't heard. Neither has it even entered into his heart what God has prepared, but God has revealed by His Spirit into our lives. So we're not waiting to know what God wants in our life when we already know because He's already revealed it. I want you to be like me. Worship. The reason we live. That everything you say and do will glorify God. without failure. Without missing the mark. Without coming up short. Becoming one with Him. And do you know when you'll decide you want to do that? When you love Him more than you love yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Because creation's groaning. Looking for the manifestation of God in His people, His Son. They're not looking for more money. They're looking for God. Because you can have all the money in the world, right? Not going to stop you from getting old. Not going to stop you from dying. And the truth of the matter is, you think you're going to die and just go to heaven. You don't know that for sure. Because you've never met anyone that's gone and never came back. And you can't find it in the Bible. You just think you can. But God has come to live in the now. 100%. In God, there is no past. There is no future. God is spirit. Not a spirit. He is spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The reason I live is to worship him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was thinking today, you know, we always talk about, you know, well, you know, people are different levels and they have different maturity levels and all this kind of thing. And I was thinking about George Warnock at 18 years old, wrote a book, famous book, called The Feast of Tabernacles. 18. Because he had a hunger for God. He knew his calling. 
He pursued God so that he could fulfill his word in his life. 18. Can you imagine that, Corey? 18. He loved Jesus more than he loved himself. Reminds me of the seventh grader who quit playing basketball so he could pursue to become a preacher because God began to talk into his life. That the creation was groaning and that men and women needed the salvation of God more than anything else in their life. He was willing to sacrifice. I think one of the greatest needs we have in the body of Christ right now, besides discernment, is having a real need for true spirit-filled prayer. A prayer life. Not a God is good, God is great, thank you for the food and everything's wonderful. Now I lay me down to sleep. No, God moving on the word that is spoken through our lips. That he will perform all that he has promised because all the promises of God are what? Yeah. And to pray, you know what? To pray, you know what you have to do? Seriously? You have to sacrifice. Anybody remember what the approach to God is? Anybody? It's sacrifice. Because it will cost us something. The whole theme of the whole Bible is this. Nothing's free. It'll cost you something. David paid the price in order to buy the threshing floor. Nothing for free. Jesus paid a price. Can you imagine? I, I laid in bed this morning and I was thinking like this. It's like, because of one person... All of creation dies. But because of one person, all of creation can live. Just one. Jesus, the Christ. Hallelujah. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Because without it, and the truth of the matter, if we understand is, remember we, I, I read this verse and I still, like I'm hung up on it big time. Jude, just turn with me to it real quick. Jude 120. Jude 120. I love this. But you, beloved, building up yourselves. Now here Jude's writing to a people. He's not just writing to an individual when he says you or yourselves. It can Include that. But what God is after in this hour is a body of people who are conformed to the image of Christ. Present your bodies a what? Living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable. Building up yourselves on your, mo on your most holy faith, doing what? Praying in the Holy Ghost. Do you remember, do you remember this? We talked about it with Ruth, what uh, Naomi said to her. said, wash yourself, anoint yourself, and then change your clothing, and then get yourself down to the threshing floor where... where uh, Boaz was, what was the next line? And don't make yourself known. Jesus was made of what? No reputation. We live in a day and hour where everybody's the exact opposite. But God is after a people that have no reputation at all. No titles. No positions to boast about how great they are. 
It's one thing to say that, look, God gave me all this. Look at how great it is. It's another thing to even walk in a deeper realm of humility where no one even knows your name. Because then only his name can be revealed. Building up yourselves in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Don't you find that interesting? Why would Jude have to tell us to keep ourselves in the love of God? Because you could drift away from the love of God? He's always wanted to be the center of it all. No mixture in our lives. No duality. Pure loyalty. No serving two masters, God and self. Can you imagine Paul's journey from beast to beauty? And God tells him when he has an encounter with him, you're going to suffer for me for many, with many things. It wasn't because of his past. It couldn't have been because of his past. If it was about his past, then that would mean that Jesus' blood meant nothing. But Jesus' blood wiped out his past. And so now his journey was going to encompass the hardships, the realities of sacrificing self-life for Christ's life, the anointed life of who God is. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto, watch this, what kind of life? Eternal life. John Chapter 17, verse 3, very clearly tells you what eternal life is. It's not some place over in glory. Eternal life is to know, to know, perceive, know, intimate, oneness, to know the one and only true God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's eternal life. It's not just a long existing of this. It's a life that has no beginning and no end. Christ. Christ. And you know, I was reading, you know, like, it's, it's amazing when you, when you catch something and you start noticing. But do you remember when David had an affair with Bathsheba and they had a baby? And then God had to send the prophet uh, Nathan to him. And he said, hey, David, what are you doing? He said, the baby's going to die now. And the Lord struck the baby. And seven days later, the baby dies. But the whole time David was interceding, even though he knew God already said he was going to die. And he prayed. He prayed. And he hoped he wouldn't eat. But the minute his servants came and told him that the baby died, you know what he did? He got up and he washed himself. He anointed himself. And he changed his garments. And then he went and sat at the table and ate bread. Everybody say he had a feast with Jesus. The servants were puzzled, couldn't figure out how in the world he could clean himself up and then eat after the baby died. But he wouldn't do any of that while the baby was still living. The old man must die. The same man and the same woman, a man and a maid, created a king. And his name was Solomon. 
And the Lord loved him. So much so that he sent Nathan the prophet to tell David, David, I love this boy. And David turned around and named him Jedidiah. Even though his name's uh, Solomon, which don't even get me going there. I found at least five places in the Bible that Solomon has a different name. Lemuel. Oh, the Bible is so rich. And every one of these stories leads you and I to Jesus so that you and I can know Him, that you and I can become one with Him. A complete unity and fellowship, the bread of life. This is why Jesus said, look, I'm the light of the world. Now I want you to be the light of the world. But the way you become the light of the world is you have to become one with me. A wind of doctrine won't save it. But a life given will. Now I want to read a couple of verses to you. Anointing we're talking about here. Now do you know this? I don't know if you know this or not. But in the Old Testament, if you use the word anointing... Um, and it, it, I don't have time to go into all the different Hebrew words, but if you read the word Messiah, where they said Messiah, it's in the Greek, the equal is Christ. So you do understand that Messiah and Christ is the same. Everybody say, Jesus, the Messiah. But there's a corporate Messiah also. Just like there is a corporate Christ. A head, Jesus, firstborn, many brethren, a body an entity or an expression, a corporation, a church that can express all of His glory. Ephesians says this. It says this is what the church is for, to express the manifold wisdom of God. It's a picture of, of Joseph's coat of many colors. That God is so expressive in who He is that there are not enough people alive to express all who He is. Which, by the way, is for the earth. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth. As it already is in heaven. How many know this? Do you really know this? I mean, do we really, really know this? There was no sense in Jesus coming to the earth and dying if He was already there. Long before Adam was ever created, He was killed as the Lamb because it was the only way that God could become visible was in the earth. And can you imagine this? Here's John, the disciple. We touched him. The invisible God we touched. We handled him. We loved on him. Put our head on his heart and heard it beat. This same Jesus who laid down his life, the tree of life, on a tree of death so you and I could live by falling in love with him. The whole picture of a church or the whole picture of a bride is that you and I would have the benevolence, the love of a wife or a husband. And the father-son duo is how a son loves his dad and his dad loves his son. The essence of relationship that cannot be broken do you know why we call them testaments and not covenants? Covenants you can break. Testaments you cannot. If God said it, so shall it be. If it doesn't happen in my generation or yours, He'll just move to a generation who will. It's the way God is. But His Word will not return to Him void or empty or not fulfilled 
So like the old preachers used to say, get on board, little children. Get on board. Might as well get on this train because it's going to happen. Might as well be us instead of another generation. Hallelujah. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I think about verse 20. Oh, yes, 20, 19. Here we go. I just, oh, you have to read this whole thing yourself. I'm just jumping in. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me. Oh, wait. I didn't back up far enough. Sorry about that. Yes, amen. Oh, I didn't back up for it. Oh, yes, I did. Sorry about that. I got it. Okay, for all, yes, yea and amen. Verse 20, okay. For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him are amen. So be it. Everything God promised, like, I don't see it happening, right? No, 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 no. It's yes. Amen. I agree with it. Why? It's unto the glory of God by us or through us. Now, listen to this. Now, He which establishes us. Now, it is God Himself who has anointed us, right? It is now He which established us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God who has sealed us and given us the earnest in, of the Spirit in our hearts. So, how do you get built up? Through the Spirit. Now, I have a question for you. Are you waiting for God to anoint you? Or are you already anointed? It's not in the future. He's already come. The deceitfulness of sin or missing the mark is He puts everything in the future or everything in the past. When God is spirit, which is in the now. I'll answer your questions that you have. And just remind me to say this. Well, what was my question? I didn't know I had. You do. I can hear it. He's already anointed. But remember, David was anointed three times. First by Samuel. Do you remember this? Saul got anointed with a vial. Everybody say man-made. Because mankind called for a king. They wanted, to be a ki they wanted a king because they wanted to be a nation like every other nation which had a king. But God had determined them not to have a king. And so then David got anointed with the horn of oil by Samuel. Then the second time he was anointed was by the men of Judah, the elders, the leaders. And so therefore he became king of Judah. Well, God's intent wasn't for Jesus just to be king of the church, was he? God's intent was for, as the promise in Abraham, what? That all the nations would be blessed. You know all the people you call heathen and you don't like them? God has chosen you to change them with your own behavior and your own lifestyle to show them that the only reason you live is to express who He is. One of these days you'll get excited that He chose you. And I can't wait for the day. It's the reason to live. There's no other reason. None. Zero. Take up space and take up breath. The only thing most people want to do is eat, sleep, and poop. That's it. Spend all their time on themselves. But God has called us for a higher thing. To worship. To express. When David got anointed, the what? third time. Everybody knows what the word anointing means, right? It means to smear or rub on. Grease. Something shiny. 
Everybody say, God is our armor. God is our clothing. How many know you can learn rules and regulations? You'll do them, but it doesn't mean it's on the inside. So there had to come a third anointing with David where all of Israel, which pictures all of humanity, came and said, yes, we bow down. We're going to walk another way, another life. The man in the mirror. Where is the mirror? Who do you see? You the sinner or Jesus the Christ living within His people? Yeah. He has anointed. But the anointing is threefold. And so I was reading the other night... And I came across a verse that I always connected with another verse. Uh, How do I want to? Yeah, let's go here first. Uh, Ephesians, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Verse 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and love unto all the saints, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Everybody say we need to pray more. Uh, Everybody say we need to pray more. Oh, hallelujah. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom. What has Jesus been made unto us? Wisdom and revelation in the knowledge or the knowing Him. The knowing of Him, right? Everybody knows this is the word epigenosco. Epigenosis. Does everybody know it? Epi is a, a, it's a, it's a Greek preposition. It literally means upon. Genosis means to know by relationship. Everybody say line upon line. Step by step. Here a little, there a little. It's the building of a relationship. The oneness of who God is. It's full discernment. It's recognition. It's acknowledgement. It's knowing Him. Knowing Him. This is what he prayed about. He said, I pray, right? The eyes of your understanding, your deep thought, the eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know. And I like this word here. This Greek word here is I do. It literally is the highest level of knowing Him. It's the third dimension. I do. Is when you're really married to Jesus. I do. I do. I do. to know Him. Not just on the outside, but from the inside out. You can train a person very easily if they're willing to follow rules. And they will. But there's a higher level that it's when it's in your heart which is worship. Thankfulness, praise, worship. Genosis, epigenosis, I do. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know I do me. There will be no more need, because now they'll be one with him. That you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us word who believe according to the working 
of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places, far above everything else. Everything else. Revelation chapter 3. Now, Revelation 3, this section here, is about the church of Laodicea. Everybody say, last church. Third from Jesus. Seventh from Adam. Third from Jesus. Okay? And anybody remember what their issues were? They didn't think anything was wrong with them. They had money. They had everything going their way. And they said, I know Jesus. But this is what Jesus said. You're blind? What did Paul just say that he prays for? That the eyes of our understanding is enlightened. He said, you're naked, you're blind, you're poor, you're wretched. He goes through the whole thing, right? And so then he says this. This is, this is really where I wanted to get. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you would be rich and white raiment, the righteousness of God, right? That you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear and anoint thy eyes with eye salve that you may see. What's God trying to get you and I to see? What He sees. What do you see? What do you see when you look in the mirror? You know, I have to admit, sometimes I look in the mirror and I say, oh my God, what happened to me? I'm an old man now. And God convicts me every single time. That's what Ruth thought. She was too old. That's what Zacharias thought. He was too old. He thought his wife was too old. Now, I don't think I'm too old. Sometimes when I see that mirror, it wants to lie. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. I'm trying to make a point here. He says to anoint your eyes. It won't come from the head. All the things that you've been taught. It has to come from the heart. Now, this word is cool. This word is awesome. Do you remember what I said? What anointing means to rub on, to smear, shiny, oily, greasy. I don't like all that grease on my face. Oh, it's the face of Jesus, isn't it? The splendor of God. But this word here, are you ready? It literally is the Greek word, I don't know how to say it, enkrino, enkrino, okay? And here's what it means. It means to rub in. Not smear on, not rub on, but to rub in. In other words, it's inside coming out. It's not on the outside trying to get in. Everybody say it's the third anointing of God. It's the fulfillment of His Word. You know what? Now, if you don't think this is cool, let me help you. Guess how many times it's found in the Bible? One. Only once. No other place. No need for a witness. Like, do you know why we need witnesses? Proof. God needs no proof. He doesn't have to prove anything to anyone. He just has to wait till we die. Now I'm going to answer your question. Hebrews chapter 2. Do you like that? You th do you find that cool? No, the, it's not about he's not smearing his life on you. 
He's not just trying to fix you up or straighten you out on the outside. Literally, he is rubbing it in. Do you know when, do you remember when Mary, oh well, it says a woman. I, I don't want to get caught up in the Mary Magdalene whole thing, but remember took the alabaster box and broke it? Broke the seal, broke it open, and then took the perfume, the anointing, out of there and did what? Poured it on his head, poured it on his body, the whole works, right? The, 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 uh, the perfume, or the it was called spikenard, right? And if you ever do a study on spikenard, this is literally, and I don't even know, spikenard, I don't even know how to say it. Okay, but this is what it means. This is how they got it. Are you ready? During the night, they cut the tree so it could ooze out. Do you know what's cool about that? It's a continual flow of who he is that won't stop. An anointing that never stops flowing out. He's rubbing it in, making it part and parcel of your life. That if you've seen us, you've seen him. One time. Oneness. This is all that he's ever been after. And he gave it to us. He's anointed us for this life. He gave us the down payment, the engagement. And if you look in the heavens, this is why he wants our eyes anointed. Look, Ruth already got the full portion. The Ruth church already has it in the heavens. And now it's your responsibility along with me and the whole church world to do what? Appropriate that life. And let the whole world know the only reason you live is so that they know that you love Jesus more than anything else. More than anything, son. More than anything. More than anything. Yes. Hebrews chapter 2. Are you thankful tonight that Jesus is here in your life? Where is He? Christ in and among you all. Do you know why he wants your eyes anointed, Selah? You know why he wants your eyes anointed? Anoint your eyes with eye salve so you can see he's not somewhere else. He's within your midst. Because without the Spirit, you can't see him. This is why the, a lot of the Jewish people, even the nation, the Bible says in, in uh, Corinthians chapter 3, this is what it says, they still have a veil over their eyes when they read the Old Testament because they don't know that Jesus has already come. And most of the modern day church don't know that Jesus has already come. Oh, they say that they know that he's inside. It's just smeared on. But you have to see, have anointed eyes to see that he's already here. A teaching, a doctrine. This is why John wrote, he says, we have the unction, the anointing of the Holy Ghost that what? No one needs to teach you this or they can't teach you this. You have to lay hold of it. You have to appropriate it. You have to pray. Jesus got up every day in the morning and went into the mountain to do what? Worship. I really never knew this myself, you know, for the longest time. What's the difference between prayer and supplication? You know how it always says prayer and supplication. Supplications are just petitions or requests. Prayers are worship. To become one. There's no request or petition 
in that kind of prayer life. Hebrews chapter 2, verse... Oh God, I wish I could read the whole thing. but Verse 6, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man? Mankind, right? That thou art mindful of him. What, is, what are people that you would even think about them? Or even care about them? Or even want to honor Him? Everybody say, this was God's original intent. If God wanted you to live in heaven, why would have He sent you to the earth, let you go through living hell at times, only to bring you back there? You might as well have just stayed there. No, he had a different plan. That the whole creation, the creature, it says, mankind, would honor God in their body. Because spirit, soul, and body are made whole. What happens once we get past all of the redemption? It becomes a people of pure worship. God's never asked us to do anything for Him. All God's ever asked us to do was to worship Him in spirit and in truth. What could you give God? What could I give God that He would need other than our love, and worship. Remember when he said this? He said, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Well, why not? I already own all the restaurants. If I was thirsty, I wouldn't tell you. Why not? I own every drinking establishment there is. He owns everything. Why? Why then are you mindful of mankind. Can you imagine? Pew. Right off the bat, the hate of mankind. A brother kills a brother. How come God didn't stop it? Because He saw the blood of Jesus to take a people that didn't deserve it because they were dead in their trespasses and sins. That they could become the beauty of the Lord in totality. Well, it's not a doctrine. It's a life. It's a person. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? Why do you care about the son of man and why is he so important? Everybody say he's important. Now, if you only think it's just Jesus he's talking about here, You'd only know half the story. He's the first 30 minutes. He's the firstborn of many brethren. He's the head of a whole body of people. He's the chief. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the light of the light. He's the life of the life. He's the wheel in the wheel. He's the fire in the fire. He's everything. He's it all. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crowned him with glory and honor. He's talking about who? Mankind. And did set him over the works of your hands. Thou put all things in subject, subjection under his feet. For you have placed everything under his authority. What's supposed to be under the feet of man? What is under his feet? All things. No, no. See, I don't want you to lose track. Pray. Building yourself up. Anoint. Eye salve. Let him rub it in so you can see what he sees. God is not schizophrenic. He's not bipolar. He understands the darkness. But to him, the darkness and the light are the same, the Bible says. He can see. You know, I, I'm always amazed when I see an animal. 
Like, it can see just as well in the daytime as it can at night, but people can't. But Spirit can. God's Spirit can. The Spirit of Christ can. Who's stronger, man or a lion? We tame them. But it doesn't change the nature. This is why your dog can be nice one moment and mean the next beast. Samson killed a, uh, killed a lion with his own bare hands. All things have been put subject. Like Steve Irwin, man, he was like, he wasn't afraid of crocodiles and alligators and none of that stuff. But isn't it interesting? He got popped. Not to be mean. Freak accident. Stingray. Right through the heart. A one-time shot. Everybody say, random arrow. Just like Ahab. Can happen to any of us at any time. I want you all to know, a lot of good men and women have died in Jesus. Never thought they would but it doesn't change the Word of God. He is desired for you and I to change the way we look at things and see things only from His perspective. Oneness. For you have placed everything under His authority. For in that... He put all subjection under Him. He left nothing that is not put under Him. Now we know, we could go to Ephesians and we could talk about Jesus, right? Everything's been put where? Under His feet. So who's He talking about here then? His body. Mankind. Aren't you glad that Jesus decided to identify himself with yes. mankind? Yes. Yeah, me too. Right. You've put everything under his control. If God put everything under his control, then there was nothing left that he did not rule. Now, like, my eyes have a contradiction at times, don't yours? It's kind of funny, before everybody showed up here, just about everybody, somebody came here, they came over the door. No, they didn't quite knock because I opened it first. He goes, oh, I'm sorry, I have the wrong place. I'm looking for a dispensary. Now, you all know what that means, don't you? That God brought you here to be a dispensary of his nature, of his character. It's not to mock the world. It's to see what he sees to dispense his life because the creation's groaning that the only thing they know an answer to is this, something under the sun. Not for you and I to make fun, to rise up above the sun, to live as the sun, to dispense the sun, to see as the sun. To frame our world. You've lost your mind. I hope so. See, what most of the church world's waiting for is Jesus to come and fix something when he says, I've already anointed you. And I'll release everything that I have promised and put under your feet because the heavens are open. I'm just waiting for you to let me rub it in. That's why he can wake you up at 2 o'clock in the morning and you can be wide awake for hours. He's not after individuals. They lay in the gap so that everyone in their world can become a participant of his nature that he's already given us. Come on. 
What's He given you? All things that pertain to... Life and God-likeness. What is mankind? I put everything under His feet. But wait, let's see what He writes here. But now we see not yet all things put under His feet. This means God has left nothing outside the control of the Son, of His Son, like you might think, oh, that's Jesus. But we're going to keep reading the Bible here in a minute. Even if we presently have yet to see this accomplished. Verse 9. Like we don't see every, verse Verse 8 says we don't see everything under his feet. But what does verse 9 say? But we see Jesus. Wait a minute. It's kind of confusing here. No, it's not confusing. Because Christ is a people that Jesus leads. He's the king of kings, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation where Jesus is the firstborn of many brethren. Let our eyes be anointed. He counsels us tonight to have our eyes anointed with eye salve. Let him rub it in. That the eyes of our understanding will become what? Enlightened. So that we can see Jesus as Jesus. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for those suffering a death crowned with glory and honor. That He by the grace of God should taste death for every person. For it became Him for whom all things are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many what? Sons. sons. Everybody knows sons has nothing to do with gender. It's both men and women. Sons and daughters. Male and female. Watch. If you don't think that's true, watch this. I'll, say, I'll tell you, i got one more verse and I'm going to stop. I know I'm, I'm, I'm just getting started, but I'm going to stop. Bring many sons to glory. For what reason? He made perfect who leads those people to salvation. He made Jesus a perfect Savior through His suffering. Now, I don't have time to go there, but just tell... Go ahead, stand up. You, this, is, this is my proof that I'm going to quit, I think. I really do believe the highest order of relationship is a father and a son. The highest. Now you might say, well, what about the wife? They're already, the two are one. The church and Jesus, they're already one. But this is what he said. He said it in Romans and he said it in Galatians. But Galatians 4, 6, he says that we have the spirit of of the Son, where? He has given us the Spirit of His Son, where? In our hearts. Don't look for Him anywhere else. You've got to get the eyes anointed so you can see where He is. You may not see everything under your feet, but you have to have eyes to see Jesus. Not just as a Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not just as a priest, oh hallelujah, but as a king and lord of our lives. The highest dimension. Where I no longer have my own opinion. I no longer have my own choices to make. I no longer do it my way. But everything is His way. His way. And what does that spirit of the Son in our hearts do? It cries, it says in Romans, the placing of a son, of a mature son, a wea son, a fully mature son. Look, this will not happen until there is a body that has been perfected or completed. So therefore we do what? 
cry, pray, Abba, Father. Let it be done according to your word. Because all of your promises are yes and amen. God didn't come and pick you out for any other reason than you and I to become one with Him so that we could become what the world is looking for, a dispensary. Well, they're just looking for drugs. No, they're looking for Jesus. They're just manifested in the natural realm. Because every human being is motivated by spirit of one form or another. So we might as well let it be Jesus in our life. Father, I love you. You are the great I am. You're the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. You started this thing and we trust you, you'll finish it. So God, tonight we lean not unto our own understanding, but we with all of our heart trust in you. So you will continue to direct our paths, guide us. And we pray tonight, God, that the eyes of our understanding are enlightened as you, as sure as you have smeared it in, smeared it on and rubbed it on, you will rub it into our lives so that we would know you. God, in spite of me, I don't care what anybody thinks about me, God. Don't let me get in the way of what you want to do in their lives. So I pray tonight, Father, let your spirit renovate all of us for your glory. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus.